What we'll do now is uh, I'm going to now acknowledge our keynote speaker uh, for today. So we have Manya Clemenci, um, and Manya is another person who is absolutely passionate about the student voice. Um, Manya, I've actually gone on and seen some of your YouTube videos uh, as well, had a, had, a, had a look at a few of those, and uh, I can tell you're absolutely passionate about this as well. It comes very much across in your uh, presentations. So Manya, is, uh, her, her keynote today will be about student agency and the concept of uh, practice. Uh, from, uh, Manya is from uh, Harvard University. She researches, teaches, advises and acts as a consultant um, in sociology, uh, in politics of higher education, also involves significantly in European hybrid, higher education and also the whole area of comparative uh, higher education as well. Yeah, major studies around student uh, uh, governance and uh, the, the student voice, student representation um, in education, which is a broader part of Manya's um, research that she does. She's got over 120 publications, uh, many keynotes. I noticed there's over 80 of those, uh, Manya. So you're a very busy person. Um, but like all busy people, uh, when they have important things to say, it's great, uh, Manya, that you've um, allocated some of your precious time to SVA and for us to be able to hear from your experience and your insights, because I know you've been not only doing the formal research in this area, but you've been a great advocate uh, for the student voice as well. So I'm really pleased about that. So Manya, I'm uh, going to hand over to you now for your presentation, but just to say thank you very much. Uh, very pleased that you'll be able to you know, be here with us today Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, Shona, Piper, for the invitation. Uh, good morning to colleagues in Australia. I am in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the moment, uh, coming into the evening hours of a, of a Monday uh, of, of teaching and things like that. But I'm really excited to be with you. The last time I was virtually in Australia was speaking at the National Union of Students uh, Australia Convention. I think it was about a year ago, um, talking to student representatives. Uh, this time I know uh, it's a slightly different, more mixed audience. Um, Piper uh, was telling me, you know, they're happy to have him, but I said I could not say no to a, such a special organization as a Student Voice of Australia. Not many countries have the organization that would really bring together the practitioners and advocates for Student Voice. So I would very much uh, want to support the work of these important organizations, and I'm delighted to join you uh, today. My talk will be about student agency. Student agency, again, it's a concept that has been around for a while, but we are kind of resurrecting it now in policy and also the scholars like myself are following with a conceptualization of this con uh, concept. So before I go into the official part of my lecture, I'm hoping that uh, you can help me with a little exercise of keywords that you associate with hearing student agency. So I prepared for you a little poll everywhere you know, uh, this is the least that I can do to interact with my audience. Uh, the chat function, as Jeff said already, is definitely open and I very much welcome as I speak already the questions and the comments. But let's try first with this uh, poll everywhere if we make it happen. So let me just see if that will work. So I'm going to be sharing and then in my busy desktop opening the, um, the chat. Here we go. So I'm hoping that you see that and I'll ask Jeff and Shona if they can confirm that you can actually see my poll everywhere. Yes, yeah. we can see that, Manya. Thank you. I would very much like to invite you if you could try to text to 22333 and then Manya Clements 019 and then insert a keyword or a phrase that you associate with student agency. I'll give you one clue, empowerment, student empowerment, and anything else uh, that comes to, to your mind. So I'm going to wait a little bit here for the responses. They will be coming live if all that goes well. well. And if you can pull out your mobile phones and give me a text or a response, a respond via website polleverywhere.com to Mania Clement 019. I'll wait a little bit, hoping that uh, our audience 
will be willing to interact with me just a little bit because I can't see you. So at least in this way, please. What words do you associate with a concept student agency? I'm hoping it will work. If not, we'll move on. You know how it is in the pedagogical sense. We have to be flexible. Anybody coming in? Thank you so much. I'll wait then for a couple of minutes. We have collaboration as an association with student agency and people are reinforcing the collaboration is growing in power, student power, empowerment again. Thank you. Thank you for very much for, for being willing to engage with this kind of a warm up exercise before I go into the lecture. Advocacy, yes. Self-determination, thank you. One of the valuable competencies that we associate with student agency, absolutely. Partnership as well, yes. Partnership, students as partners as well, right? Change student agency as a towards directed towards the change responsibility to the students thank you my goodness we have a very competent group here with us validation of students yes representation of students uh, voice or vocal engagement support thank you it's our word cloud is on fire now thank you so much let me see what else value innovation as well Collaboration is still big, student action, student change, student power, authentic knowledge, ownership as well, right? Student ownership of their own universities, if you give them agency, if you allow them to be agents rather than the, rather than the objects of, the, um, of being passed on the knowledge. Accountability, validity, yes, responsibility to students. So have students being responsible for their own learning education pathways, but also for the higher education institutions of which they are part of or education institutions to which they belong. Thank you so much. Look at this, our cloud. I'll keep it on for just a matter of more. seeing students as experts as well. Exactly, in expert or so representative roles, students as expert roles, providing valuable insights into decision making within the higher education institutions. Wonderful, you're a wonderful audience. I don't see you, but thank you so much for being uh, willing, your willingness to engage with me. Look at what we have. We have awareness, we have assertiveness as well. Uh, we have voice together, so lots of collaboration, partnership uh, as well between students and other members of the academic community, like uh, Jeff has spoken earlier. Uh, expression, support, learning, thank you. I'll stop it here and uh, we'll stop sharing and go now into my slides, but I'm keeping this one. I'll send uh, to, uh, to my colleagues at the, at the Student Voice Australia just to remember uh, this one. Thank you so much, revolutionary, somebody mentioned exactly. Student agency can be as well uh, enacted for revolutionary purposes when really big changes, social transformations are necessary. Thank you so much. I'm stop, stopping this part and going now into the um, official part of the lecture with my PowerPoint presentation. Let me just try to set everything up. I haven't been on Zoom for a while, thank goodness. We are back in person here at Harvard. Um, so here we go. And I'm going to try to do it like this. I'll probably have to stop this one, the word cloud, which is completely full right now. And we'll open up don't mind my busy, busy desktop. There you go. And just a moment. I have to start sharing once more, more because I think I posted before. There we go. There we go. So we are starting. I'm making, putting into the PowerPoint presentation so that you will have it easier. I'll try to do with you about 45 minutes lecture with some intermissions um, and uh, via the chat function. I'm sorry I can't interact that much more because webinar has a more limited uh, possibilities of interacting with the audience. So I'm trying really to introduce the concept of student agency uh, as linked to student voice, uh, kind of offer a more overarching framework uh, of what we know under this uh, term and kind of uh, 
bringing kind of an umbrella uh, conceptual framework uh, to our discussion on student voice. Um, so the thesis that I'll put forward today to you is that to understand and to foster student experiences and student outcomes in higher education, we need to understand and develop not student satisfaction, which were kind of like earlier phases of, uh, of that was promoted and measured more in the consumerist ter terms, not even merely student engagement, but really student agency defined as students' capabilities to navigate, influence, and take responsibility for their learning and education pathways and the ecosystem, high educational ecosystem of which they are part of. And if you're wondering, so where the student voice come in this is really this part on influencing, right? One is to navigate, to understand how education institutions of which they are part really work and to find their ways around them. The other one is voicing the concerns, asserting themselves as some people put into the cloud and, and trying to influence and then taking the responsibility, not just for their own learning and education, but also for the institutions of which they're part of. So this is the th thesis that I will be um, going forward. Um, I, this is the overview of my uh, lecture for today. Um, I'll start with the policy context. I will try to define what is student agency. Uh, and then I'll look really into the two aspects of student agency, which are both interrelated. One is student agency for self-formation, and the other one is student agency for institutional and social changes, more what we associate with voice. But voice is also in the self-formation part. Um, and then in each of them, I will engage you in a discussion in how higher education structures or education structures can help develop or strengthen student agency for the purposes of self-formation or for the pur purposes of institutional social change. So this is the part of the discussion and I'll be inviting you in the chat function and I hope you will be with, with me. The sources here are uh, the forthcoming chapter in the research handbook on student experiences in higher education, which colleagues from, I think, from Australia and New Zealand um, are uh, Chi Baik and Ella Kahu are, uh, are editing and th there I'm proposing a theory on student agency in higher education and some other works that, that I have done, a forthcoming chapter as well on, on introducing the theory of student impact in higher education, which isn't completely finished yet. So um, I'm not putting it into my sources yet, but it's something in the writing because it will be done in the next couple of weeks. Um, so this is where I'm going in chat as we go, please feel free to add comments and suggestions and questions and I will leave time at the end and in the intermissions to kind of engage with those questions already. Um, so let's start with the policy context. Um, in the policies, I would say that student agency is emerging as one of the um, foundational concepts. Yeah, at least the OECD has forefronted it more clearly than any other international organization I have seen. Uh, in fact, they have put it at the forefront of the OECD Learning Compass 2030, uh, claiming that it's rooted in the principle that students have the ability and the will to positively influence their own lives and the world around them. So really very much kind of showing the basic principles of student agency. And they define it as the capacity of individuals to set goals, reflect and act responsibly to affect, ch uh, to affect change. Um, this concept is um, informed by the progressive educational philosophy um, that uh, argued that the purpose of education is also to prepare individuals to become active uh, uh, and in agentic individuals, um, agentic within the communities of which they're part of, part of agentic with the community members uh, with whom they share the common spaces. Uh, and that those are the kind of a, uh, key principles that enable uh, functioning democratic societies, functional cultural spaces, um, and also uh, free open market uh, economies. So it's, it's very much, and, and OECD puts it like this, that uh, student agency is about acting rather than being acted upon, shaping rather than being shaped, and making responsible decisions and choices rather than accepting those 
determined by the others. So this is the new policy context uh, uh, developed in 2019. And, and in a way, uh, researchers, we are kind of uh, catching up. There were several studies already that have introduced student agency concept before uh, in the scholarly work, but no, no kind of a comprehensive framework. And this is where I'm trying to fit in the gap or fill in the gap as well conceptually, and uh, hopefully also do empirical studies following uh, uh, on the basis of that. So from the policy context, I'm moving into the definition. Um, and, uh, and basically, I gave you the earlier definition really uh, identifying student agency as capabilities of students, right? Uh, we said not to navigate, to influence, and take responsibility for their own learning and for the education ecosystems of which they are part of. But student agency, the way that I uh, conceive it here is premised on student agentic opportunities, which are external to the student and are part of the structures uh, of which they are part of, and the agentic orientations, and those are internal to the students and very much linked to the students' uh, motivations, dispositions, uh, the will to act, um, as um, as also OECD has put it. Um, and in a very this conceptual model of student agency, I, um, I try to explain it as a double conversion. The, the one part of the conversion is where the student, students' agentic orientations in interaction with the structures and the processes of which they are part of um, develop into a set of valuable capabilities. And this set of valuable uh, capabilities comprise student agency. It's all very the theoretical at the moment, but I'll just give you that, and then we'll try to bring it more back to where we started the, with the word cloud uh, that is more useful for the practice. So the conversion students' agentic orientations related to their backgrounds, related to their dispositions to actions, and translation of those into the valuable capabilities. And then the second conversion is really conversion of the those agentic capabilities that students have developed into the students' experiences uh, and student, student outcomes in, again, engagement with the structures and the processes. I'll leave it at that. There is all that is explained in that uh, chapter on the theory student agency, but I'm not going to go further into the heavy uh, theoretical work. I'll try to move a little bit beyond that. And maybe if we think about the instrumental value of student agency, we of course uh, go back to the literature that shows that the more agency students are afforded in higher education, the better learning outcomes and the less likely to drop out from higher education they are. And they have been empirical research, uh, uh, there has been res empirical research supporting that proposition. And then there is intrinsic value of student agency. And, and that is that if students have this agency, if we help them strengthen agentic capabilities, we are actually fulfilling that mission of preparing them to become agentic individuals, also beyond the education institutions of which they're part of. And those agentic individuals, as mentioned earlier, are central to the functioning political democracies, cultural spaces, all open market economies, and their local communities of which they're part. Again, acting with other members of local communities. We don't want to, I don't want to, with a student agency kind of a, uh, signal individualism. It's not. It's a lot. It is about partnership. It is. It is about collaboration, as you have highlighted before in the word cloud. And then the second part uh, of this intrinsic value of student agency um, suggests that if institutions afford student agentic opportunities, they become sites of citizenship and civic involvement themselves. And in that way, enable students, uh, education uh, of students for active citizenship and development of the civic competences through action, not through just courses teaching them what civic competence should be and what civic uh, participation means, but actually institutions themselves um, behaving as sites of citizenship, uh, behaving as real communities uh, where all of the members, all of the uh, internal constituencies are members of these communities uh, in partnership and in collaborations and in joint responsibility for the well-being of that education community and of the institution that they are part of. Okay, so so this, is the, this is the part of the intrinsic and the instrumental value of student agency. Now, 
I'm moving into the part where I discuss student agency for cell formation. As I discussed earlier, kind of differentiated into two different um, segments, both interrelated, but still conceptually slightly more distinct. And one is enactment of student agency for the purposes of self formation. Here I go with uh, Simon Marginson, uh, a fellow Australian now in Oxford and the director of the Center for Global Higher Education proposition that we should view really higher education um, as, a, as a student self formation. Uh, and, uh, and here you know, I look into the, the, the opportunities, agentic opportunities and agentic dispositions that allow students to develop capabilities that will foster their self-formation. And the list that you see here is really the collection from the literature, educational research mostly, of the valuable capabilities that researchers have brought together to help students uh, pursue that self-formation. And I'm sure with the audience that is there, given your backgrounds, uh, either in the student development or student engagement offices, um, or fellow students, this will probably not be new. I'll just kind of try to bring them all together into one roof as a valuable capabilities, um, kind of a set of capabilities comprising student agency for self-formation. Um, Bandura in 2005 article has kind of has nicely uh, collected them uh, highlighting intentionality, so self-direction, forethought, setting goals, uh, anticipating likely outcomes of actions, self-regulation, Zimmerman, uh, uh, developing goals, developing strategies, assessing strategies based on the outcomes and then another cir circle starting again with the new with the new goals new strategies and personal development planning is one of the concrete actions which uh, i think probably and i will i hope you will be telling me in the chat if if that's something that you do in australia as well but it's very much practiced in britain less i would say in the united states um, but where i think all good educators should help students to do is within their own courses i try to help students to be self-regulated in the sense to set their personal learning goals in my course um, and, uh, and, and, and develop their own study strategies. And I need to help them as educators to develop own strategies uh, in order to kind of uh, bring and reflect on those strategies in order to stimulate uh, their uh, self-regulation and thus learning outcomes. Self-authorship and self-awareness, uh, self-determination, as colleagues have mentioned before as well in the word cloud, self-efficacy, so kind of a sense that, th that you can succeed, as Bandura puts it really nicely, unless people believe they can produce desired effects by their actions, they have little, little incentive to act to even try, right, or to persevere in the face of difficulties. I'm adding here mental well-being, which hasn't been much discussed yet as a capability, really. Um, it is often linked to the concept of grit, the persistence, uh, um, kind of a, a progress mindset uh, or growth mindset. But mental well-being, especially after COVID, it's also one of those capabilities that is important for self-formation, for actually enabling students to act in order to develop their, their, their learning outcomes um, and so on. So I added this one here. Um, so this is just, I would put them, this is kind of a set of capabilities that I would associate uh, with student agency. Student agency that then, when they enact students' these capabilities would help them uh, towards achieving the outcomes, learning outcomes or personal uh, learning goals or professional learning goals that they have set for themselves. Um, so here I come now into a um, hopefully a little bit of a chat discussion. So I already see there is a chat going on. So a little bit stop um, because I'm hoping that we can discuss uh, from your context how through what kind of services or what kind of measures or practices uh, your institutions are helping students develop those competences or those capabilities I have discussed earlier um, that scholarship shows us is, are helpful for students to 
self-form or develop their uh, achieve their learning goals so i'm going to stop here i'll go into the escape and stop sharing so that i can go into the chat and uh, see if there are questions in the chat first of all but hoping as well that people will be willing to bring into the chat some examples of how your institutions or the offices that you work in help students develop student agency self-determination self-regulation do you have a specific do you practice personal development goals and and students preparing personal development goals identifying those or some other pro, uh, processes so let's see nothing yet so i'm going to you know like i do with my students pause a little bit here um that was a kind of a conceptual a big conceptual junk on um trying to understand student agency for the purposes of self-formation before we go into discussion of stu enacting student agency for the purposes of uh, institutional social uh, change okay so let's see there's, there's a couple there's a couple coming in now then yeah yeah Thank you. I am beginning to grab a glass of water and see. Uh -huh. Student as partner program CMB 063 is giving here to me and I would love to hear the explanation how this works. If you could just give me a couple of more uh, words, what does that mean? Is it training students? students um, for different roles within the institutions such as expert roles or um, or something else student representatives working with academics definitely um, uh, strengthens certain capabilities of them to uh, assert their voice and give them the spaces right so mentoring programs Shona thank you yes mentoring programs would that be student peer mentors or would it be um, academics or staff mentoring students in terms of how to navigate higher education environments okay juliana is saying here students running workshop of topical issues sustainability uh, issues knowledge is always empowering right uh, the more knowledge it is the more the sense of self-efficacy can come in that students feel that they can actually succeed uh, in in the environment Okay, let me just see now. Okay, it is the whole training and interacting with other people within this program as students. Okay, so, so it's a, all right. So it's a kind of an underlying principle. Thank you so much uh, for Christina for explaining this. So, so um, students as partners program is kind of a whole training of interacting uh, with students and engaging students, right, within the program. Thank you training and induction of newly elected student representatives with additional strategic planning to assist scaffold them planning out the entire term so goal setting strategy developing definitely strengthening their um, individual capabilities but also organizational as a student union or, or the group collective of student representatives mm -hmm. thank you student staff partnership projects collaboration and problem solving in teams for continuous improvement really nice as well again uh, passing on some of those valuable competencies of planning uh, strategizing evaluating your actions thank you thank you so much everybody for for pitching in as well i i am known for doing inductive lectures i don't like to kind of lecture this is a special context we are on a zoom webinar but uh, i like to as much as capture the knowledge which is in the group uh, in the audience and this audience has ample of it so let us capitalize on that as well suzanne is um, speaking about student ambassadors with areas of responsibility academic integrity exactly so they're placed into the position they're offered kind of a structural opportunities agentic opportunities to act as a as a ambassadors um, in uh, different issues for example academic integrity we have them as well we have honor council here at harvard where students are real partners to the staff so it's 50 percent students 50 percent staff all of with the same voting rights or decision rights in that body uh, peer mentoring yes okay and postgraduate Shona is, uh, is sharing peer mentoring is, is, is wonderful uh, for this. Um, we have a peer advising program, PUFFs are called here as well at Harvard, where the senior students or students in upper classes are uh, serving as 
peer advisor uh, to the younger students, uh, basically helping them navigate the space, right? Understand how this strange institution, complex institution works and how they can find their way around and understand how to be a student and succeed as student in this institution. Choice in assessment topic to align with interest career trajectory. Darcy, thank you very much. Uh, Darcy Taylor, thank you. This is very much of allowing students agency within the courses, right, and the course curriculum, allowing some flexibility, some choice aligned with their own interests, because that will be more motiva uh, motivational for them, because, and then they can link as well what it is in the course to other areas of their interest. Wonderful. So this is definitely agency for self-formation. Okay. Um, using current students to MC events, MC events, I'm sorry. And as presenters, aha, uh -huh. all right. So, so really, really using students as well in the full capacity as presenters as well on an equal role rather than just the audience, right? That is leading. So they are uh, coordinating like Shona is with Jeff today. Both are in the coordinating role of this event rather than just students always being the audience on the receiving end. Mm -hmm. Student governance framework. We are moving in there. So uh, some of this thing, some of those practices will be repeating itself when we move into student agency, really for the institutional change and social change, more directly student voice. Um, but but I'm going to mention them nevertheless. So Brie Glasbergen is discussing student governance framework, assisting students to represent different groups uh, within the student ecosystem. Student representatives also need training, right? They also need capacity building. They also need to strengthen their capabilities in order to be able to represent students uh, uh, fairly and, uh, and efficiently and professionally and really exercise the voice uh, and the powers and the authority that was vested to them uh, through the elections. So wonderful. So they have the trainings to run meetings, prepare agenda, create events, all very much empowering and all helping them build the capabilities, strengthening their agency. Thank you, Brie, for describing this. Fiona McCourt as well from New Zealand. Hello, Kia ora, Fiona. Code for learner well-being and safety. I like that. Learn and then there is a, one outcome of the code is learner voice, which means that the area providers have to partner with learners to ensure their voices are heard across the organizations. This is then regulated, monitored by the New Zealand Qualifications Authority. Very interesting. So really formalized uh, way uh, formalized code for the learner voices um, involved inside the, the education institutions and I like the code for learner well-being because having a voice really does contribute to the well-being being heard uh, having agency rather than only uh, being being told what to do or how did the OECD people say it, rather than just being uh, um, acted upon rather than acting right uh, really nice and regulated to the to the point of the uh, being monitored by the New Zealand Qualifications Authority I'll check this out it's really interesting if you have a link Fiona please put it in it's going to be easier to find those regulations Yes, Juliana says a simple measure as having students sit in the meetings is empowering, not only because they have a voice, but also to kind of learn the meeting dynamics um, and uh, vote on the matters as full partners, not just as the observers. Yes. Again, Osama is highlighting students as partners programs, students as sounding boards, as influencers, decision makers and co-creators. So really empowered in all of those kind of same uh, rights, right, uh, as, um, as other decision makers, as true partners. Okay, we have a lot of things. Okay, let, let me say the last three and then we'll move, move more. There are already instances here with the student voice, but then I'll go into the student agency for the purposes of um, institutional reform, decision making uh, and some social transformations if needed. Okay, student uh, as partners program as well, students advisory gro group, um, meeting students and academics meeting quarterly to workshop solutions to challenges experience. How wonderful. Uh, and then uh, students come as their cohort, about 5,000 students. So really students have the responsibility to, to seek to aggregate 
student grievances or interest and then be able to floor them and discuss in this quarterly workshop with the academics on the challenges and trying to find the solutions. A true partnership indeed. Thank you, Simon Fendra. Uh, embedding student interns and casuals into non-academic projects and programs to create uh, like for like uplift in understanding between staff and students. Interesting. So this is a kind of a um, uh, student ser service roles, right, as interns in different type of the programs as well. Um, and create and again in a full partnership. So here students step in into the kind of a questions of programming and operations, right? Uh, that's how I understand it. Um, mm -hmm. And we, this is the Academic Quality Agency for University in New Zealand. Thank you for introducing yourself, uh, Shilak Mater as well. Um, work with national students associations and universities to develop capability for new students coming into academic decision-making roles. So again, training the newcomers, um, passing, helping them pass institutional memory from the previous ones so that they can embrace and that they are prepared for the roles uh, that they have acquired. Wonderful. Student Voice Summit, I think I might have spoken in that one in New Zealand. But I have been in a lot of events, as Jeff has said recently during the Zoom. I traveled a lot virtually. Uh, okay, and uh, Miguel collaborative peer facilitated mentorship to guide and empower young students towards academic integrity. Very interesting, very interesting. And here is really um, academic integrity is, is, is an important aspect of uh, our academic enterprise. And here it's really empowering young students um, to embrace it and to know how to cope and using peer facilitated mentors helping them. So it's a lot in kind of a prevention as well, uh, rather than sanction, right? Uh, and in this way, empowering students. Wonderful. And Fiona, thank you so much for the links. We'll check that. Uh, we'll check that later. Thank you so much for, for this very interesting practices and, and kind of a connecting me to your worlds and your context so that I can understand in which way student agency is manifested and, and enacted in your context. I'll now continue with a little bit my second and final part of presentation um, where I'm moving into the, the uh, student agency for the purposes of, um, just a moment, I need a little bit clear my, my busy screen so that I can yeah, there we go. So I'm moving here now into the student agency for institutional social change. So the first time, the first part I try to kind of say that students need, the student agency has to be strengthened so that they can fully develop their learning outcomes, so they can kind of achieve that self-formation, which should be the objective of each higher education institution. And that is presuming that you know when students come into the educational environments, into the universities and other type of higher education institutions or education type of institutions, they don't yet have all of the skills or understanding how to study skills or how to navigate those spaces, what's possible, um, how to read the invisible curriculum, how to understand the norms of behaviors, how to be a student in those spaces. And this is where programs such as partnership program or a peer mentoring program can help them or um, training or advising programs within within different offices and this is where important role is played as well by student representatives who work with the academics and others to kind of uh, help develop programs that will help each student to find a way um, to navigate the spaces to find a way of how to express their voice, their concerns, either through the student representation or directly, and, and be able to be agentic as well within the curriculum, uh, within the, the courses through flexibility, as one of the colleagues said, uh, allowing options in, in terms of assignments uh, that will allow the student to follow, uh, follow the interest. So this is, this is one aspect. Um, the other aspect student agency I want to highlight is really enactment of student agency for purposes of institution social change. And here I'm, I'm going more straightforward into the discussion of student voice. And we have ample literature already 
um, uh, on student voice and student as, as partners. We have also a journal on student as partners in higher education. This is a kind of a recent development within the last decade, but very much taking front, not only within the Ang Anglo-Saxon world, but it's, it's going to other parts of the world as well. Uh, sometimes with a slightly different uh, emphasis uh, in, in the Latin American context would be still about student representation, student activism, student solidarity, rather than the concept of student as partners. In the Asian context, often it has to find some kind of a consensus or middle ground with the Confucian um, ideas about respect for authority and uh, or for the elderly and has to find a way there. But it is um, it is the concept. Uh, they are these are the concepts and the literature that is uh, that is becoming global as well. And what this scholarship affirms is the uh, positions from the agency theorists and the prominent agency theorists like Margaret Archer and Giddens that it's not only that higher education structures or education structures and processes have effects on agents, in our case students, that there are also just effects on them and that it is due to the structures and processes that students learn and professionally develop and so on. But in fact that agents, in our case students and learners as agents, um, can also have effects on the processes and the structures of higher education. So within their learning and education ecosystems. So that they also have agency. Within the sociology of higher education, we have um, several domains of study. And one of the largest one is the one on the effects of college on students. It's called college impact on students. And what is researched there is um, everything from student engagement and how that is helpful to prevent the dropouts and how a student engagement is is helpful student engagement in educationally purposeful activities is helpful for the students learning outcomes um, uh, about personal development and what kind of activities help it about the belonging all of that is captured within that do domain but what the, what the research largely fails to acknowledge is that students also have agency in the context of higher education, also have effects on other students and on their institutions. And this is where this, uh, where the issue of student voice comes into the place, play and, and really kind of a broader discussion of student impact uh, on higher education. Um, so when we think about the capabilities needed for students to have the voice um, for institutional social change. We can think about the same or similar set of capabilities we have discussed earlier for the self-formation, the forethought, intentionality, uh, self-regulation, self-efficacy sense, sense that the change is possible. Um, uh, so, so all of those are relevant here, here as well, but this time enacted for the purposes of uh, institutional change, or if you want to go beyond it, social transformation, rather than for the purposes of self-formation. And again, the importance of agentic orientations and agentic opportunities is, is still there, right? It is still means that students have to have a will and motivation to act, and that there have to be opportunities for them within the structures. Either opportunities exist already, or they push for the opportunities to present themselves so that they can have institutional and social change. The programs that you have mentioned before, students as students as partners program, the New Zealandish example um, of very formalized rules for the learner voice, those are the agentic opportunities derived from the from the environment that I speak about. Sometimes they do not exist, and this is where students have to become agents for the changes and and claim those spaces and, and enact those changes that bring about um, uh, agentic opportunities for them to express their voice. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more theoretical here um, to discuss, well, I'm sorry, I should be actually in the presentation mode so that you can see it better. Um, so I have this um, another conceptual framework, and this is the student impact model in higher education, which really explains how student agency is enacted towards student impact on higher education. And this one has five propositions. 
I'm sure all of them very familiar to you, just judging from their previous input in the chat. Um, and the first proposition is that students in a variety of roles on campus or within their educational ecosystem can directly and purposefully influence the, these higher education ecosystems. And these that I call high impact roles or the roles for direct student effects on their higher education ecosystems exist within student representation, um, on campus employment uh, or voluntary services. Uh, in the examples you have mentioned before, we have student interns program, we had student peer mentorship programs, um, they, they were somebody mentioned as well students that are part of the academic and the integrity uh, committees. Those all are high impact, potentially high impact roles of the students. Leadership roles within student groups and organizations, again, uh, present opportunities for those students to have effects on other stu students and together collectively shape the student life or um, uh, campus life uh, within the institution that they are part of. Activism is also a uh, possible high student impact role. I don't know the relationship uh, in Australia, New Zealand to activism. In the U US, from the uh, from the revolutionary 60s um, and uh, the protests um, uh, and the more adversity of the institutional leaders towards uh, activism, I think we have more in the recent years moved into the at least narrative of um, student, uh, of, of university leaders embracing uh, student activism as a form of civic engagement. So it's a kind of a change in the narrative uh, I think the conditions still are as long as it is non-violent, uh, so peaceful pro uh, protest. But it's a it's an interesting change in the in the uh, at least the, the framing of the relationship that institutions have towards the activism, rather than to prevent it and uh, and control it um, and seeing it uh, seeing it as a kind of a, uh, deviant behavior now into more kind of embracing of student activism as a, as a form of, of uh, civic en engagement. But that's the, that's the US example. I would be interested if you would be willing to share in the chat what are the kind of attitudes to activism in your context. So as said, so there are campus roles, uh, potentially high impact campus roles that enable students uh, and afford them with this, at least with authority and opportunities for having effects on other students and the institutions of their part of and uh, and the student impact of course on a longer continuum so different roles afford different potential degrees of impact some are more high impactful than the others and the same student role affords different degrees of impact at different times um, for example um, I student representation, student representative roles, so elected student representative, in principle, at, le at least according to the formal rules in most of higher education institutions, this should be high impact roles. But there are ways for institutional leaders to you know, diminish the, uh, the power of the students. Um, and uh, I mean, the trick tricks that uh, can be performed are not informing the student representative properly even if they are invited to the meetings and have voting rights in the meetings not training the student representative properly um, so they can be professional and and impactful in their roles i mean there are ways that uh, that despite the authority vested in the student representation the power can be diminished um, if it's being manipulated uh, as well and of course then we have a lots of systems where students do not have um, partnership uh, type of uh, uh, engagement relationship within the student within the institutional governance and that's that's a different story which is not the case in in, in your context so different uh, types of, and sometimes the expert roles can have even more uh, impact and representation and and in some um, higher education system especially the ones that i'm part for, of it's really engaging students as, as experts in in different faculty committees nowadays these students come from the student representation but it hasn't always been like that and it's not always the case for all of the committees in some committees there's a call students can apply and then they are selected 
by the administrators or uh, based on the competences uh, that they can bring and uh, and the expertise that they can bring to the committee's decision um, so so it's uh, it really very much depends on the arrangements of each institution and then um, the fourth one is kind of a obvious based on what we have discussed before that institutional structures right the processes the culture that is part of the institution can enable empower or deter student impact opportunities uh, so there, there's a variation in the agentic opportunities that then allow students to enact agency for the purposes of institutional change and then secondly that there are certain agentic orientation that are important for students to enact agency towards the institutional sense. And the ones that I highlight here are students having a sense of citizenship, uh, having that sense, like, like Fiona and, and uh, Jeff said before, that students are full members of the academic community, that they are respected as members of the, uh, and affirmed as full members of academic community, as full partners within the uh, institutions that they are part of. The sense of belonging that students have to the institutions, the, the sense that, they, that this is my institution um, is also uh, important. The sense of efficacy, as we have discussed before, that the enactment of ages actually can bring about changes, that it's possible to change things if they put in effort and, and work collectively, for example, um, but also public service dispositions, right? Some students are simply not interested in engaging in this type of role. Some are very much career oriented and, and really just work towards getting the job afterwards. And some are more academically oriented and really kind of devoted to the, to the academic works uh, course or athletes or other extracurriculum activities so not necessarily the public service dispositions that would um, motivate them to join and take on the roles that have effects on changing the institutions um, or enacting institutional change or or change beyond you know so, social transformation as well uh, and activism beyond the campus itself so it's it it has to do with the agentic orientations as well but some of those things, sense of citizenship, the community that is based on really fostering belonging of each of the students, uh, sense of efficacy um, can be the ones that can act as motivators uh, for students to actually take on the roles that are potentially impactful in this regard. And the fifth one, I always kind of um, take one unlikely. I, I'm not fully sure if it fits, but I just wanted to kind of uh, add it as an afternoon. Before I spoke about the roles where students directly and purposefully seek those roles to, to have effects on their higher education institutions or education institutions, there are also, um, students can also change or affect the structures uh, and processes within institutions indirectly. And this is where the consumerism really comes in. And uh, I'm not going to go much in it because this is not usually that I include in my, but I just want to kind of recognizing is it that students as consumers through their expression of individual and collective preferences have effects on institutions. Uh, again, in the US, we know of uh, perverse examples that uh, that uh, institutions are putting a lot of money into lazy rivers the pools or the climbing walls uh, because they believe that uh, that will attract fee-paying students as well uh, who care about those amenities uh, in in the in the colleges that they they join so so this is uh, this is the indirect uh, uh, effect that students can also have on higher education institutions but um, in this talk i really want to focus on the other ones um, on the representation on the uh, paid and voluntary service roles on the leadership roles that students have uh, with with their student groups and organizations and put potentially activism, which where there are more purposeful direct effects that students can have on institutional changes. So this is pretty much what I have. I am going to uh, either engage you into the um, more examples of those structures that uh, influence student agency for institutional change, but many of those you have already said, or I'm ready to open up uh, this talk for further questions and your input. And I have already 
um, I'm opening the chat now, so I'm going to stop sharing. My next slide is really just thanking you. Uh, but I'm opening now, hopefully for some questions, comments uh, from your side. Again, sorry, I can't hear you speak, uh, but I hope that you can um, help me with the chat function. And I have Jeff and Shona here as well, um, hoping to, to uh, contribute as well. Thank you. Okay, Manya, look, thank you very much for that. That was a fantastic uh, insight you know, into agency and agentic you know, behaviour from students. Um, we, as you've said, we've opened it up now for uh, questions, comments. Uh, please type in there any questions or comments that you've got. But Manya, I'm going to start off just while people are starting to put things in there. Um, and really just a very practical question, um, because with students... Uh, we know that many of them are quite busy. I think you probably sort of indicated that as well. So how do you, how does an institution facilitate, promote, encourage, um, you know, students being agentic uh, when the sort of students probably, you know, they might have part-time work, they might have some, many might have families or other responsibilities. How, how do we actually help them? Be, be agentic within the within an institution? Jeff, this is an excellent question. And we have it, Fiona McCourt is, um, is basically uh, asking us along the similar lines. Um, and it's really the question of uh, um, equality and access to high impact roles, right? It is uh, because students, as you rightly pointed out, um, they have they have to economize their choices that they're making on how they're spending time within their higher education education institutions and often that kind of economizing decisions involved am i going to take on a paying job because i have to it, which helps with my li living it's a kind of existential question and how much time do i still have left for uh, um, pursuing public service roles, which effectively those uh, high impact roles are. Um, and what I see increasingly across uh, institutions in the United States, but also in Europe is some form of stipends for student representatives and students who are taking um, uh, uh, roles as experts in, in the various uh, task forces within higher education institutions, just to ensure that we are not excluding out of those uh, roles, low income students who depend on um, on labor in to support themselves and or their families uh, during the time of the study and kind of really uh, create equality in access to the public service roles uh, across different student populations. So, and this is not, it's a, it's a question, you know, what's the, the, there's no easy formula, uh, but it's a, either a form of assignment or a kind of hourly compensation for this role that is becoming much more practice. I see it in, in, in the European context, it is the student unions who tend to take on these roles that uh, take care of, of some kind of compensations. And this is not full salaries. Uh, this is not like UK where they have a paid sabbatical student officers. Uh, it's usually small hourly stipends, uh, but just helping them if you either you have to work for hourly wage in some kind of job or you're contributing in the in in the different discussions uh, so so it's it's a it's a kind of a some sort of compensation in in the us of course we have residential colleges and residential colleges create a lot of um, campus jobs so um, variety of roles especially kind of being interns in women's center or student sustainability officers or honor council officers would be compensated it would be just another form of student campus jobs those are usually hourly again hourly wages or a stipend a fixed stipend i don't know five hundred dollars for the entire year would be then a compensation for playing this role because otherwise uh, the situation you pointed very well it is inequality in access to the public service roles for those who have to work uh, while they're studying and this is pretty much a majority of our student population isn't it uh, so it's it's hardly in any kind of system that we we no longer have uh, I mean, most of the students are working one way or another, some more uh, than the other, but uh, but this is how we would then ensure the, uh, the 
equality in access to public service roles, basically. Public service roles that are valuable, you know, engaging students in the roles that are then valuable as well for the um, advancement of the university in the sense of uh, joint decisions, as, as uh, colleagues have discussed before, where academics and students come together to address the challenges that students have um, identified uh, within their community um, and so on. So this is something, but I would be interested in how you are dealing with that question as well in Australia, whether stipends or some compensation is common or not at all, is uh, that is the case. So if somebody is willing to, uh, Shona is uh, pitching here in as well, could this be the case of getting higher education up to the same standards of other industries in healthcare? It is increasingly required in policy that consumers are compensated for their involvement in research, for example, yes, particularly if they participate in co-design co of research services and progress. This is one example, and, and yes, uh, I would say that some compensation for uh, because unpaid, I have a student right now in my class who is doing a project on uh, on unpaid labor among students as well. And again, pointing especially to the difficult decisions among the low income students who have to work while studying and uh, not choosing public service roles, which all of those roles are because of their existential issue of, uh, of needing to earn money um, if those roles are uncompensated. Yes. yes. Yes, I think on there, Manya, there's a couple of comments yeah, yes. that people have put down about the paid, non-paid. Also, I think it's interesting, and, and perhaps you could let us uh, know about your insights into this. Do you think there's any difference in the attitude of students if they're paid or not paid in terms of how they perceive um, either the importance of their agency or the impact that they're able to have um, if they're in a paid versus a non-paid um, yeah, relationship with the university. It's also a very interesting question, whether it changes in, in some sense. I think the some sort of compensations, it's, it is affir affirming that their contribution is, is valuable and, and, you know, and valued by other members and that uh, it's not, and they don't feel exploited for, uh, you know, kind of free labor on unpaid labor contributing when, while they know that everyone else that is on the same committee is actually doing this as part of their job description, right? Uh, whereas they would be coming in as, as volunteers. Uh, so, so it is, uh, it, it is this kind of affirmation of the fairness of being partner in that particular endeavor. And again, you know, that doesn't mean salary, but it, it is some form of com compensation. I mean, some, um, institutions, this is European smallly, are, are thinking about credit, course credit, especially kind of a service learning type of courses could give credit to students for, uh, uh, for public service roles on campus, right? So that could be an alternative uh, uh, possibility. So students, if they serve for one term, one semester in a public service role as members of the Students Affairs Committee, for example, or Honours Council Committee, that they uh, receive for that a course credit, uh, provided that they also kind of offer some kind of reflection. Usually they would be a reflective paper attached to it. So it's not just having served, but prompting students as well to reflect on, on, on that service role. That is, but usually a more more common nowadays is becoming a sort of hourly compensation or a stipend for that uh, for that role. Um, so uh, again, you know, it, it's the question, I think, of affirmation and and just being able to take take time, right? Uh, because they are split among many different uh, opportunities, what to do while they're on campus, some where they have to work for pay, but also other extracurricular opportunities, being part of the choir, you know, so they, they actually have to uh, balance their decisions on what to do. Uh, uh, and I think compensation is helpful or course credit, if, if that's a possibility. Okay, let me see now a little bit, Jeff, uh, help me if you see something that I don't see. Um, so we have, uh, ha we have covered the potential of, you know, the effects of compensation or especially in tackling the inequalities in access to public service roles. Um, and uh, our staff often make comments about their workloads and being required. Just a moment, this is jumping a little bit. 
Uh, oh, Manya, that was just a comment from me that our staff always say that they're being asked to do more for the, either the same, you know, remu uh, remuneration or uh, whatever. And I think we just need to, you know, think about our students in the same light. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to undermine. I, I think that our staff are often overworked as well and kind of adding on the roles as well, especially. And we know that anything to do in terms of service to students and student engagements tend to be, um, you know, uh, challenging tasks and, and, uh, and require a lot of time commitment and often emotional labor as well as part of those uh, roles as well. But in the same way, students um, also kind of put uh, put in their time and, and their insights. Okay, so um, uh, Fiona is saying she hasn't seen a difference in attitude across paid and unpaid roles. Always very engaged. Fiona, I tend to agree with you uh, on that because there are just students who have this kind of a public service disposition, right, that uh, try to give give it the best uh, and will give it their voice. And I have worked so much, you know, in my life as a student rep, I was serving uh, on a various, in a various roles on a various levels up to the being a secretary general of the European Students Union, uh, representing over 11 million of European students towards the European Commission, the Parliament and other institutions. And I mean, on a very kind of a limited salary if, if it was at that time, but it was still paid. But lots of, but my executive committee, they were all volunteers, all fully and 100% engaged. Um, um, and it's, um, I would say they will do it nevertheless, they will do it, but the question is, who is choosing those roles and who can afford doing this role and whom we are missing among the, the students who are taking on the roles because they, they cannot afford to take on the roles, right? It is really the question of equality uh, of access to the public service role. But you, I agree with you, those that are committed will, will work and uh, uh, well beyond uh, what is what they're asked for because they're committed and they're doing it for the purpose right is give them also the sense of having a purpose while being a student as well and uh, i guess uh, manya some of the other comments there um around our regulatory uh frameworks and environment and and that would vary i guess across different countries as well um and also when it starts moving into like whether it's a work integrated learning activity or an internship or a sort of formal thing that's part of a course versus something which is done outside of the individual course and is more general rather than sort of course specific. So I guess that's partly what that comment is about. Although I wonder whether you also want to pick up on the one Kelly uh, has put there, which is really about, um, at least I'm reading this Kelly and you can explain if I didn't get this right, around the individual versus the collective so is the agency around well i'm doing this because it's enhancing my agency as an individual and i'll be able to do use this for other things i want to do later on versus i'm doing this as part of a larger group or part of a community that i belong to and that's actually why i'm doing this uh, wonderful comment, Kelly. I sometimes struggle with this kind of individualistic lingo or the narrative framing that, that especially much a sense uh, capabilities approach might suggest. I'm trying to fight it um, and really emphasize the collective nature of engagement uh, uh, that's, uh, of students and, and enactment of student agency. Uh, and the representation, student representation would be a prime example, just the awareness that there's so little that one can achieve one, on one's own in that context. But also if we talk about student self-formation, learning is essentially a social process. Students learn not just from their teachers and by themselves, but most of the learning happens within the classroom from their peers as well. So as a kind of a social, social process, collaborative learning is one of the most effective um, pedagogical method that one can enforce within within the classroom. Peer to peer learning and creative opportunities for peer to le peer learning and another highly impactful method of teaching. So, so if there is a way that I can reframe it, uh, uh, please, uh, you know, send me a message. But uh, I, 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 I do take your point that kind of a talking about the agency um, might kind of a misleadingly emphasize the individualism, right, the persistence, rather than uh, attention to the collective uh, pursuits 
that uh, students are uh, engaging in when they are pursuing institutional changes or the collective nature or co uh, social nature of the learning that happens within the classroom and students in enacting agency in, in that context. But thank you so much. So I definitely want to drive home the message of student agency, um, not supporting the individual endeavor, but really uh, enforcing student students being part and equal members of a community and engaging with other members of, of, of that community. So I, so definitely um, going against the individualization because it simply doesn't work. And and even, you know, I want to send, it's kind of a, there's lots of talk about, you know, grit, persistence, uh, growth, mind, and all of that. And I reject it also on the purposes because uh, first of all, we are part of the social structures, right? And and also, it's not just up on the individuals uh, to achieve that. It is really very much part of the of the social structures in which we are that help students to develop those agentic capabilities and create opportunities for students either to be agenting within the classroom with the flexibility options, or to be agentic. Um, and as partners of the of, of their institutions pursuing institutional changes or changing finding solutions to the to the problems that they have identified so so thank you so much uh, for for kind of pointing this out because uh, i really wanted to have a chance to clarify it but definitely uh, relational community partnership narrative rather than individual narrative behind the student agency but i i see where you come it could be easily seen because especially um, because i'm framing it very much what on amartya sense capabilities approach which is also taking uh, for more individual uh, individual um Ge jeff can you help me a little bit to find me? look i think there's um yeah so people have put in some comments examples things there but i will just um perhaps uh, manya uh, encourage you to give us your thoughts on the issue of the different the different voices that need to be heard. Because if we think about our student body, um, our student body is very diverse. So we have, in all of our jurisdictions, we have international and domestic students. We have students uh, who are straight out of school versus students who have had a sort of a significant life experience. Um, you know, uh, we also have um different cultural groups you know within within our institution how do we how do we facilitate or how do we encourage a diversity of voices and how do we avoid a situation where there might be some voices that for whatever reason appear to be a bit louder than other voices um, and and that means that some voices don't get heard at all even though we might have great intentions we might say, look, we want to hear the student voice because it's something that we often think about here. And I'm just speaking about my university uh, now, but in any tertiary institution, I'll have a diversity of voices. What's your experience around that? Oh, Jeff, a difficult question. A difficult question, and I have seen uh, student unions and student councils very much struggle with it as well because in principle, they should be open representing the interest of all of the student population um, and student population is becoming increasingly diverse as it should and this is a good thing but how do you capture all of these different voices and how do you bring them uh, and how do you aggregate all of those different student interests and in order to be able to represent them and intermediate them to the institution it's a difficult question um, i've seen some uh, examples where uh, where institutions have have tried uh, software instruments such as direct voice I think it was one of them was uh, here in Australia as well so a lot of instead of even going through student representation out of fear that they might be not bringing all of the voices they sometimes try to do this kind of a de direct democracy um, so uh, with a kind of a short uh, referendum type of polls on, on issues, hoping that they will really kind of capture the interest of all of the community. So this was one. Uh, I think you'll have to look into the colleagues here in, in Australia. I think it was Melbourne that tried it, how effective that um, direct voice was. It would be really just kind of poll 
on a certain new policy and check them with the students. So, so this is one way. But I think that the onus really lies within the representative student uh, associations with student unions and the councils um, to canvas broadly in their community to purposefully seek diverse diversity among the elected representatives um, and uh, and be mindful of seeking the representative that can represent the different vo diverse voices uh, of, of students uh, it's very difficult to do much more so so i think that uh, it is part of the training of the new elected representatives as well uh, in uh, really looking into their own structures and seeing if they are doing enough of outreach as well among different represented among the, the students so that they they're bringing the candidates that can reflect the represent uh, the, the diversity of their student bodies and sometimes the student unions have caucuses caucuses for different uh, uh, subpopulations of students first generations international uh, and so on so this is one of the the possibilities uh, as well I, I, I must, I can't help but noticing there was one comment here as well, it's just going back to the compensation of students and uh, somebody was suggesting that that might be a kind of a conflict of interest. I'll just point out if we go back to the compensation, not necessarily for the same compensation for the same roles. There's really a question, what kind of roles are you asking students to do? If you want them to be part of the task force that is going to be uh, highly intensive uh, deciding on important things everybody else is based you might consider uh, compensation if you uh, call students together for a town hall to discuss the curriculum development for the study program that you're part of is you're not going to compensate in people on that right um, if you're asking a student a student to be part of your evaluation committee part of the accreditation agency you're going to compensate that particular student as you're compensating other members of the evaluation panels going into the uh, institutions so it really depends on what kind of role if the students uh, are compensated through their union already and are on salary like in the uk you're not going to be compensating them because that's part of their job description to come and uh, uh, be uh, speaking in the senate or academic senate so again it there is a difference in that regard i just wanted to clarify that part before we close and we go to the next panel who uh, which is already joining us is there anything else jeff that you would like to point out for the for the final round uh no i think i think you've done a fantastic job manya uh look i just want to thank you for first of all uh giving us your insights um and also hearing a little bit about your studies as well your research uh but also i think um you've really generated exactly what SVA is about. And that's about sharing our experiences and sharing our insights and actually asking lots of questions. That's really what it's all about. That's how we learn, uh, by asking lots of questions of each other and then finding out what other people are doing. Um, so, you know, we'll we've, we've, we've recorded this, we've captured all of the text, we've got some fantastic um, things from, you know, participants as well, as well as obviously all your, um, you know, formal things that you did as part of your presentation. So look, we really appreciate your time um, here. And as you can tell, you know, this is a group of very passionate people uh, here um, today. And uh, this is something that we want to continue to grow in and with. Um, and I think having a sort of an international uh, uh, community as well is really important because as you're very aware, you know, things are different in different countries and, and they play out differently as well. And that's how we learn from each other. But, you know, everyone's committed to having that student voice um, in, yeah, and, and whether it's, you know, SBA, whether it's the other groups around the world, whether, I mean, New Zealand colleagues, They've got some fantastic work that they're doing as well, like here locally. Um, look, it, this is really important, but it's really great. So, look, on behalf of everyone, Manya, we just want to thank you very much and really appreciate your time.